He said, my son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Solomon, in this chapter of scripture, or in this passage of scripture, he first gives instruction that we're to follow relating directly to being a biblical parent. But today, as we continue, he continues by explaining to us why keeping the father's commandments and the law of the mother is so important in the life, first of all, of Israel, his son, then dealing with his own personal son, Rehoboam, but also, from an inspirational perspective, he deals with us as believers, as the sons of God, on how important it is biblical, to have biblical parenting. I talked about last week the fact that even if you're not a parent, you may have spiritual children, or you should have spiritual children, who are in your life that you end up having a, a, a parental relationship with, uh, in dealing with them. And I talked about last week, a uh, few weeks ago, the fact that uh, many of us are grandparents even raising children. So, so there's a need for biblical parenting and we're seeing the result today, even here in Kansas City, of the fact that not much biblical parenting is going on. Amen. And this city is suffering as a result of it. So we want to bring people back to the words of God. So today, let's look at verse 24 where we're going to start. And let's read through this passage to see what we're going to cover today. He says, starting in verse 24, and let's look back at 23. He says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is life, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And then he gives us in verse 24 the reason. He says, to keep thee from the evil woman, from, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. He says, lust not after her beauty in thy heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. He goes on and says this. He has questions. He says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. <clears throat> but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committed adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it he says, destroy it, his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content though thou givest many gifts. So what happens is this, as we enter into verse 24, we are immediately again introduced to this evil woman, or what he also calls the strange woman. We've seen her before. 
Her husband is the evil man who introduces to the world, watch this, from a doctrinal perspective, false teaching, false religion that is disguised as philosophy, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, theology, and every way of the world that is designed to remove the truth of God's word as the final authority and instead make it what we look to to solve the issues of life that, that, that Solomon discussed in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Now we know her inspirationally as the woman, the strange woman, the woman who would we would commit adultery with, or in this case it would be a strange man if you're a woman, because women commit adultery too. But this strange woman doctrinally is the organization of false religion. I'm going to explain that. Doctrinally, she is the woman that God warned his son, the nation of Israel, to beware of their dealings with her because what she does, she did this to them. She seduced them as a nation through what is known as Baal worship. This woman, along with her husband, the evil man, who is also known as the Antichrist, or the man of sin are best understood biblically when you study the life of Ahab and Jezebel. In 1 Kings chapter 16 through 19. Ahab and his wife Jezebel, the evil wicked king of Israel and his controlling wife who was a self-appointed prophetess of Israel. Now, you need to know, as you study the life of Ahab, that he was one of the 18 types of the Antichrist. In other words, if you were to look at the Antichrist as a whole, there are 18 men in the Bible who each one of them have an attribute of who the Antichrist is as a whole, so that you can study the lives of those 18 men and each one of them will give you a different aspect that collectively, when you study them, you will figure out who the Antichrist is. Ahab is one of them. Now, the reason that they, the number is 18 is because in Scripture, most of us know the number 666 as the number of the Antichrist. There are 18 because 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 18. And there are 18 types of the Antichrist. These are men who foreshadow the Antichrist himself. But here's the thing to remember. The Antichrist, because he does everything to, to, to counterfeit what God does, he, like God, has his own religion, so to speak. That religion was represented by Jezebel because of its falseness. It, 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 it is a woman. And in 1 Kings, Jezebel stands in contrast to Elijah, who was the man that God used to represent himself in the same manner that we now, as the New Testament church, are to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is false religion that we come against because where we are to represent true religion, and you know I hate to use that word, right? Because religion is not a good thing, always, amen? amen. Right? Right? But where we are to represent true biblical religion, there is false religion that looks like it is religious. Okay? But unless you are indoctrinated and know what truth is, you will never know that you were in it or up with it or it infiltrated your life. 
It's like a banker who works in a bank who knows the difference with his eyes closed of what real money is. He doesn't have to actually see it, but he handles the truth enough that he knows when he touches something, that's false. That is where we as believers need to be so that someone doesn't come ring our doorbell and before we know it, we have been tossed about, as the scripture says, with every wind of doctrine because someone comes in with false doctrine and because we were not indoctrinated enough in what we were to believe, we end up running after her because the church is a female. We are the bride of Christ. Amen. What, what false religion offers is strange to us, and it is understood here in Proverbs 6 as the strange one. Last week, or two weeks ago, because I was not here last week, we looked at how keeping the commandments of the Father and not forsaking the law of the Mother will guard us. So that as we move on, for that had to do with adversity. But today, we're going to go from adversity to adultery. The first verse that we'll look at today is found in verse 24. And we're going to look at the flattering lure of adultery. He says this. The reason that the Father's commandments are so important, the reason that the law of the mother is so important, is to do this, to keep you from the evil woman. Now, understand this, so the Father's commandments that he talks about in verse 20 has to do with the Word of God, right? Doctrine. Inspirationally, it has to do with your father, if you're a parent. You need to listen to your parents, okay? We need to listen to, especially when there's a biblical father who is, is caught in, is in the things of God, and the things of God are important to him. He's made them important, important in the home. He's made them the preeminent thing in the house. He has instructions, but those instructions still from the co come from the commandments of the Father. Amen. Right? Amen. Now, here's what Solomon is saying to his own son. Son, keep my commandments. And what they'll do is keep you from the flattery of the evil, or the flattering tongue of the strange woman. Now again, this is mostly taught in, in, in a very inspirational way. And, and you know that I want to teach that. And I will. But I want to take you in under, to help you understand doctrine. You can go to another church and just hear inspiration. Right? You can go to any church and hear inspiration about adultery. And it, it is very relevant because we live in an adulterous society. People have no problem committing adultery. But we'll talk about it. But here what we have in verse 24 is the issue uh, of the sin of adultery and the consequences surrounding adultery. Here's the thing. God is a good God, but God is a God of order. God first established a people that he would use as his people, that through them he would accomplish his mission in the world. They were the nation of Israel. God called them out. He established them in a, as a nation. And what he intended for them was to be the people that all the peoples of the earth would go through the nation of Israel to reach the God who they found in what was called the Holy of Holies. God wants you to be in the Holy of Holies. He wants you to have this relationship with him that is, that is so deep and is so, you know, holy in the things that he, he they had to go through a priest they had to sacrifice to, in order to receive him. Well, what God did to us in the New Testament is that we are the priest. And we don't have to go through. The only person we have to go through, the scripture says, is the man Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Right? But we can, according to the scripture, can boldly come to the throne of grace, Amen. not needing to go through any priest. Amen. Not needing to go through a man. I can have a direct act relationship with the God of heaven, and I don't. And you can have a relationship. You don't have to go through me. You know, many 
people come to me and they say, Pastor, pray for me. And, and often their, their thing is that your prayers get to him. I know you can get to him. And if I can't get to him, then I need to go through you so we can get to him. Because really, here's the issue. I need him. Right? So I'm going to have you pray for me because now I know my prayer is going to get there. When the reality is, what God has done is placed in each one of us, the Holy Spirit of God, that we can boldly come to the throne of grace, man. And we can, and, and the scripture says that a time of need. Hallelujah. Come on, Praise the Lord. Come on. Praise God for that, right? But this is what happened. God set out and gave these, and had these people, the nation of Israel, right? And he intended for us to be able to be able to go through them. And, and I told you this a few weeks ago. The devil doesn't know the plan of God up front. He has to wait to see what God is doing. And then what he does is comes in and says, okay, I need to disrupt that plan. In the same way that he did in God. He, he wrapped himself around the tree, he's hanging out. He says, so what's God going to do here? Right? And now up front, he reaches into the dust of the ground and he formed that. He says, okay, what we got going on? And then he sees him, puts him in the garden, and says, okay, well, I see that. Okay, what's he going to do now? And, and he sees God say, be fruitful, multiply, and repent, Sarah. He says, how's he going to do that? It's just him. Then he sees that God put him asleep, and he reaches into his womb, and he makes a womb man. And he says, oh, okay, now I get what he's going to do. So let me go to her. And he goes to eat. And he says, God, you should sure die. Come on, Eve. How many people you ever heard say, what, would a good God call someone to die? That's what he did. He said, come on. But once he knows what the plan is, this is what he does. He did it to the nation of Israel. He devised his own system. He said, okay, God, if you're going to go through Israel, what I need to do is infiltrate Israel and keep them from re receiving what you have for them and I'm going to do it through women. Because the one thing that a man will give up everything for. Come on, man. Tell you guys that are married. Amen. Right? A woman will wear you out, man. You know, you can have this heart that I'm going to do it and she comes along and your plan is changed. So what God did to Israel was he forewarned them and said, don't go after the strange woman. Stay within the context that I have set up for you, but don't go outside of here because here's the problem. They will introduce you to their strange gods. Today, God is using the church as the Christ representatives to reach a lost world and a dying world. Here's the difference. Where people had to go to the nation of Israel to have a relationship with God, he's told us, I'm going to place the Holy Spirit of God to live in you, and you go ye there for them. Right? Don't wait for them to come to you. You go get them. Here's the deal. Satan, the evil man of sin, he knows that God has a plan for the church. So you know what he does? He uses his own religion to destroy the work of God. And you know what he'll use more than anything? A strange woman. I have seen men who have been, they, 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 it, and please understand what I'm going to say here. Don't take this personal, even though some will. I have seen men who, and I've seen women, who if it weren't for the person that they were with, they have a deep, deep relationship with God. They'd be available for the church. They'd be available for the things of God. And either on either side, either some woman comes along and her attitude is, hey, you know, you get a little bit too religious here for me. <laughs> you know, I, I want to go to church, but I don't want to be there every day. You know, or some man who says, baby, you know, let, let's go do something else. You know, I mean, I appreciate you, you, you being involved in this church and everything, but don't you think you're going a bit overboard? You know, with it? Now, 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 and I say this, someone confronted me about this, and, and, and I don't mean anything negative by it, but a comparison would be the Kansas City Chiefs. 
You know, we see them and we have uniforms for them, we have chants for them, we have tickets for them. We, 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 we go and, and, and tailgate four hours before the game even starts. And then stay three hours after the game ends and then talk about it all day Monday around the water cooler. Right? And then we read and we hurry up and get the paper and we read about them and we want to know and what's the stat and how the quarterback do. And just, we know everything about them, but when it comes to the things of God, we can be a fanatic for the Chiefs, but we don't want to be a fanatic for the Lord Jesus. Okay, all right. Yeah, that is true. We're in the Old Testament. Israel is known as God's wife. The church is a female and the bride of Christ. Because Satan counterfeits this, he uses his own woman. When the church represents the unadulterated religion, the strange woman represents false religion. Now the wisdom of Solomon that we find in Proverbs is this. He says to keep thee from the evil woman who uses her words to flatter. Now many people may frown upon the fact that as a church we have made a stand. So that when we all read, we all are of one mind, having the same love, and we all read from a 1611 authorized standard King James Version Bible. If you stick around long enough, you'll figure out why. But I am not ignorant to what the scripture says that the thing that I need to be on guard of is the words that are used to flatter. And in the same way that he changed the words to Eve, when God said, thou shalt not surely die, he says, you, he, what did he say? He says, you shall not surely die. Now it sounded exactly what God said, but his intent was different. But he uses the words of God and he makes them sound like the words of God, but his intention is different because he knows the importance of words. When we look at adultery, there are two types of adultery found in Scripture. First, there is physical adultery. When God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments, the seventh commandment was, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. This adultery is committed physically when sexual intercourse takes place between a married person and someone that is not that person's husband or wife. It says this in Leviticus chapter 20. And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. Now I would imagine in the New Testament with the Lord Jesus Christ, was, they were brought to him a woman who would, they said she was caught in adultery. It says, and the Lord Jesus Christ kneeled down and wrote in the same. I can only imagine that what he wrote was Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. For this reason, they brought the woman who was caught in adultery. Where was the man? See, both of them were to be put to death. But they bring one person, they didn't just say, we believe that she was in adultery. They said, we caught her. Who'd you catch her with? See. <laughs> but it's also the physical act of fornication, although Jesus told us this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, quoting the seventh commandment. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So he gives another qualifier for adultery. When you think of adultery, and I'm not going to preach on this, but the greatest 
uh, story in the Old Testament would be that of David and Bathsheba. Not only did he commit adultery, but to cover it up, he committed murder. But the second type of adultery is what's called spiritual adultery. It happens when you leave God for another God. This is what happens in the life of Saul in the Old Testament. In the, but in the context of Proverbs 6, Solomon is dealing with, the, uh, of course, his own son, right? But doctrinally, spiritual adultery is what happened in the case of the nation of Israel who went after other gods and committed adultery against God. It happened to them physically, but it is a spiritual picture of what happens to us in the New Testament. This is what God told Israel. He said in verse 34, Exodus 34, he says, For thou shalt not worship no other God. For the Lord, watch this, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. I want you with another woman. What man would want his wife with another woman? Or what woman would want her man with another woman? You know what God doesn't want us to have? Something that replaces him in our life that he would be jealous over because he wants to be preeminent in our lives. Do you realize that your relationship with God should supersede your relationship with your spouse? Hear me. Because if you have the right relationship with, with God, it will make the right relationship with your spouse. Yeah. Amen? Amen? If you have the right relationship with the Lord, I guarantee you, your marriage will work. He goes on in verse 15, says this. Here's the reason that he's a jealous God. And why they weren't to worship other gods. He says, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods. And do sir, 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 uh, a sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their God. Now I want you to realize something, right? This is what Moses wrote in Exodus. But the man who's talking about this Solomon in the book of Proverbs, there wasn't a bigger whore than him. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There was no greater whore than Solomon. He, was with his, he had a thousand concubines and wives. You know what I mean? He Solomon. I don't know how Solomon did it. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. But this much I know, he learned it from his dad. Because see, his daddy was a whore. Yeah, he was. He was a whore. As a matter of fact, you know, we use that. <laughs> I know y'all laugh, but hallelujah, that's what it was. Right? If you, you saw a woman, you call her one in a minute, but we won't call many. See? That's what he was. Right? To the extent, when you study in the book of Psalms, as a matter, it leads you to lend to the fact, and I've showed you the verses, that when David died, he died of what was called a loathsome disease because he ended up getting a venereal disease as a result of being a whore. Keep being out here messing around. There, ain't, there might be a cure for venereal disease. That ain't no, they ain't once you get AIDS. Young men. <laughs> You know, I, it kills me because men, men try to have multiple wives. Let me tell you something, I've been married for almost 38 years. I'm trying to keep the one I got happy. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Baby, you spend a lifetime doing that. You, you try to figure that out. You'll be busy. You know what I'm saying? You're busy trying to keep multiple women happy. All right. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Secondly, the point is the flaming lust of adultery. He says this in verse 25. He says, lust not after her beauty. He says, in thy heart, neither let her take thee with thy eyelids. Inspirationally, the beauty of a strange woman, a woman that is not your own, is to entice you into focusing on how good she looks. 
The danger for any man, or in this case a son, is to allow your heart to be drawn to her so that you end up lusting after her. The problem is that beauty is only skin deep. Yeah. What is enticing is her outward appearance, not what she truly is. This kind of woman uses her eyelids to entice you. She has a look of modesty. She winks and raises her eyebrows because she speaks with her eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul. Only this woman, she has no soul. She's out to destroy your marriage, to destroy your relationship, to destroy your character, and she will take you with her eyelids, but doctrinally, she is the beauty of what false religion looks like on the outside, but false religion cannot atone for your sin debts. And I say that, and most of you know that I came out of Islam. Now, Islam was very attractive to me. My nephew is here, he knows where I'm coming from. Islam was very attractive when you see the guys in the bow tie with the bean pot. Standing on the corner selling the newspaper. And, 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 and this is what they do. So often they go into the jail systems and they try to draw men who are in need of something. You you worked in you guys that Leslie, you guys worked in a jail system. You know, God God become religious. All guys become religious in jail. Right. <laughs> First of all. But what has happened is. Islam has come in, and Islam is, is a very attractive religion. Here, here's the thing, to the extent that people are being seduced by her over the internet. ISIS is able to attract people over the internet. That's how good she looks to them. And what they do is that they, they consistently bombard her, bombard her, and they, she looks attractive, but inside, what she cannot do is give you eternal life. The third point is this. There's a fear for loss of adultery. He says this in verse 26. He says, for by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt for the, for the precious life. Inspirationally, a man who gets involved in an adulterous affair is reduced to a piece of bread, watch this, while he tries to carry on the affair. She'll break what you. Because you're trying to take care of two homes. You ever see the man trying to take care of two homes? He's trying to provide over here, but provide over here. Bro, he ain't a bro. Soon, he will run out of money because of it. But remember, she is false religion. This brings us to the religious system of the evil man that is spoken of in Revelation 17. Watch this. It says, with whom the kings of the earth, this is what we've they've done with her, this false religion. They've committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Hold on. So he carried me away in the spirit to, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed her outward appearance in purple and scarlet color ever been to the Vatican yeah. <laughs> and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having watch this a golden cup in her hand mm. which is the symbol of the Catholic Church <laughs> full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication and upon her forehead was written a name was a name written Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is the religious right of Rome who reduces everything, watch this, to a piece of bread. What do I mean by that? The piece of bread in the Catholic Church 
One of the most prominent parts of, of their religious rite is something called the Eucharist. We also know it as communion. It's where it is believed that the bread and the wine are literally changed into the body and blood of Christ. Literally. They literally believe it, that you guys that have been involved in Catholicism understand what I'm talking about. This is also called transubstantiation. There is no evidence that any change comes to the elements through this ritual. The bread and the wine have the same taste, the same color, the same smell, the same weight, and dimension. The bread still looks like bread, tastes like bread, smells like bread, and feels like bread. Yet, they teach that eating it is how you get Christ in you. When the priest blesses the bread and the wine, he says the words hocus corpus meus, which almost sounds like hocus pocus. <laughs> because in effect, what happens in the ritual is that they literally believe that the bread and the wine are literally changed for, to the, the body, literally, and blood of Christ. Hmm. Almost like It is believed that because the piece of bread literally becomes Christ, that when it is taken, you literally eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. And the verse that they use to substantiate it, why they do it, is found in John chapter 6, when Christ said this, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. This is the verse that the Catholic Church uses to substantiate why they believe this. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. They use that to say, there it is. That's what the scripture says. So tell me that what we're doing when we partake of communion is not actually the flesh and blood of Christ, not understanding that it is a picture of the blood and, and body of Christ. Paul substantiated when he said, you know, whosoever eateth of this, this cup and drinketh of my blood, do show his death till he come. It is nothing, it's not him literally, right? But that's what they use to do it, okay? Now, let's move on. So first, the next thing that Solomon does is this. He asks a question in verse 27. He says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Now the obvious answer to the question is no, although I am reminded of the Hindu who tries to walk on coals in a religious rite without being burned. But the truth is this. The adulterer in the affair, keep doing it. Eventually, you'll get burned. I've seen it all too often. When someone traffics with a harlot or tampers with another man's wife, you know what? Here's, the, here's, the, here's the, what he's saying. You're playing with fire. The scripture teaches in Galatians 6. He says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God always sees to it that immorality is paid for in the end. In the case of David, Samson, and the prodigal son, they all found it out. The only reason Judah escaped the penalty for his bad behavior was that he repented. But even he did not escape. Two of his sons became vile and died under the anger of God. So then here's the second thing. The question is then answered. So he says this in verse 29. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Marriage in the eyes of God is a sacred union. You know that? You know what it is? Is that, that God establishes in the context of marriage a covenant. Now, I've taught people this because it even goes so far as to say this. And this is why, and please, this, we understand what God meant here, right? Uh, every covenant 
is, is that God has made in Scripture, uh, there is a blood. Blood is, is involved in that covenant. Even to us in the covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ, because his blood was shed for us. But in the covenant of marriage, uh, in, in Israel, if a man went into a, married a woman and went into her and she didn't bleed, meaning her hymen broke because she was a virgin, he didn't have to stay married. Because the covenant was a blood covenant, where blood had to be, to, you know, you had to show, right, that you were still a, a virgin. Right? Otherwise, the man could give her back. He was out of one. He allowed, God allowed him. But here's the thing that's happened today. Marriage is a sacred union. It's a biblical institution that is set up with rules and boundaries and regulations. It's to be set apart. It's to be sanctified for God's purposes, not man. In our armed forces, there are special forces. There's the Army Rangers, there's the Green Berets, there's the Navy SEALs, there's Delta Force. There are special people who are cut out from the crowd, who are set apart from the rest of the general armed forces. And they're no ordinary soldiers. They are cut out from and are cut above the rest. You know what God is calling us to do in marriage? He's calling for us to have a marriage that is set apart from what the world is offering as marriage for the purpose of demonstrating to a lost world that what God hath joined together, let no man put us under. Woe unto those that have taken this institution and prostituted it, making it something that God never intended it to be. Woe unto those that have gone online and have been ordained for the purpose of marrying two people, marrying them outside of the rules that God established between one man and one woman in the context of biblical marriage. Within marriage, there is to be love and loyalty because of the fact that marriage is a picture of God's relationship to us. He is loyal to us. Amen. He loves us. Amen. And he never leaves us. Amen. He never forsakes us. He is in with us to the end. Amen. Hear me. You know, I think about it. You know, we have marriages where God forbid that one or the other makes a mistake. Oh my God. We're out. Yet we say that marriage is a, is a mirror of the relationship that God has to us, but we feel like we can just do God any kind of way, and he's supposed to just hang on to us. Right, mm. right. Ooh. What if God did us the way we did our, our spouses? Ooh. Ooh. You know, because we live in this divorce society where wherever you don't want it, get rid of it. You got a car, you tired of making payments, of it, let them come get it. <laughs> you got a house, you, you, I'm tired of living here, let them foreclose on it. Right? You got a job you don't like, just quit. Even if you don't have a job. I mean, that's where we live. So, we can, so, so in effect, what we're doing us consistently, we live in this world of divorce. We divorce ourselves from every situation that we don't like. Amen. Right? So now when it comes to the Lord, we don't have a problem divorcing him. Amen. We have no problem divorcing him whatsoever. Everything we know, we divorce. If I don't like it, I'm done. I'm out. I'm out. I don't even like the shoes. I wear them five times and then take them back to the store and say they don't fit. <laughs> it's where we live. We grow up in that. But what happens is this. Within the context of marriage, there are guardrails, like on a highway, designed to keep a wreck from occurring. God has put the guardrails of marriage around sex to keep wrecks from happening. A woman who is pregnant and takes drugs make her baby an involuntary participant in her drug habit. A woman who is pregnant and drinks alcohol makes her baby an involuntary participant, participant in her alcoholic habit. In the same way, a believer who is involved in adultery makes Jesus Christ an involuntary participant in their adulterous affair. Here's point C, because he makes a comparison. He says this in verses 30 and 31. He says, men do not despise a thief if he steal 
to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But if he be found stealing, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house to make restitution. Solomon here makes a comparison between the seventh commandment and the eighth commandment because he says this in Exodus chapter 20. Verse 14 says, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but it's followed up by thou shalt not steal. The comparison is simple. In society, most men will have a tolerance and sympathy for any person who's stealing. In this case, a thief. Because he's stealing because he's hungry. You know, I'm, I'm a, a man's hungry. You know, well, I mean, I, I, I could be mad at a thief. But if he's stealing to feed his family, you know, we have a little bit of sympathy for him. We say, well, you know, I, I think it's wrong that he stole, but the man's just trying to eat. You know, you know, no one's mad at a man for trying to eat. Right? We can all sympathize and understand the lengths that a man who is hungry will go to feed himself and his family. But the law says that if he gets caught, he must restore what was stolen, and in this case, he says sevenfold. Okay? That man will, will, will still have many people who still sympathize with him, especially if his motive is to satisfy his hunger. But restitution can be made for stealing a man's wealth. But here's the question. What restitution can you make for stealing a man's wife? On the other hand, the kleptomaniac, the person who steals for pleasure, deserves no sympathy. I don't know the hell do you steal? He do come in my house and he just steal because he saw it. I've had those kind of people in my house too. You ever have somebody got to follow them around your house? <laughs> Wait, be wait, they come out the bathroom, you wait. <laughs> Go check your medicine cabinet. <laughs> right? Now, in the same manner, the man or the woman who sleeps with another man's husband or wife deserves no sympathy. What he fails to understand is that he lacks understanding that he is going to stand before the Lord accountable for his actions. Because whatsoever a man saw, that's all he also read. Right? Why? Because of my first point here. We're almost done. Adultery is destruction in verse 32. He says, but whoso committed adultery with a woman, he lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. This is true in adultery, and it's true for the person who is involved in false religion. The man who's in bed with a strange woman, spiritually. When you commit spiritual adultery by your involvement in false religion, you know what you do? You destroy your own soul. Physical adultery is a sin against the body, but spiritual adultery is a sin against the soul. It says this in 1 Corinthians 6.18. You realize that, that fornication, adultery, and it's, let me explain this difference. Because of what Jesus said that you can commit adultery in your heart, you can commit adultery without committing fornication. Because fornication is the act. Mm -hmm. okay? So you can commit adultery in your heart without actually sleeping with a woman. But God looks at fornication very seriously. Do you realize, we say this, every sin is sin. Do you realize that fornication is the only sin that God sets apart? Look at what he says here. He says, flee fornication. Every sin, every sin, every sin, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication, he says he sins against his own. That's because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives in you, he is sealed in you, and whatever you do, you make him do. What you do, he does. Forgetting, it does not exonerate you from the responsibility of living in obedience. Adultery, it destroys homes. It destroys reputations. It destroys churches. It destroys relationships. It destroys children. Adultery is destructive, but it's also this. It's dishonor. He says in verse 33, a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. If a thief is caught stealing, he'll suffer dishonor and reproach for his actions. But one caught in adultery, 
because of God's view of sexual sin against the body in the eyes of the one who was caught in it, it becomes almost, if there is, and there isn't, the unpardonable sin. God doesn't play when it comes to this. Should he get caught, there could be many wounds that follow. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I've seen, though? I've seen the destruction that adultery can cause in families. I've seen families where some grandfather committed adultery years ago and the destruction that it caused generations later because of that adultery. I've seen it. When children are produced out of wedlock, when children are produced because of the adultery. You know, I've seen it happen. I've seen families just completely destroyed. Where for generations the story within families is told of the grandfather who cheated and the destruction and dishonor that it caused to the entire family. The woman or the man involved is never trusted by anyone. I've seen it in churches where adultery is taking place, where the woman who is in the affair, and it's a shame that it happens with the woman more. The men are almost like, you know, in that wrong, in that wrong, right? But the way where where the, the and especially the women in the church are let her know you're not welcome here. Because if you cheat with him, you'll cheat on mine. I've seen it. There's no honor in cheating. David understood that. Here's the thing. Third thing, adultery is also distressing. He says this, for jealousy is the wage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance when he's trying to get that person back cheating with his wife. He will not regard any ransom, no, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Mm. Jealousy is a passion that surpasses all passion. There's nothing st stronger, more determined, or vindictive than jealousy. Jealousy is the source of what happened to Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14 that caused his fall from his position as the cherub that covered. It was his jealousy of God that caused him to try to overthrow God. When a man or woman involve themselves in adultery, often what will push one or the other over the edge is jealousy. Jealousy will provoke a way a provoke rage in a man. To seek revenge. Look at what it says in Numbers 5. God says, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, if any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her, carnal, and he be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the man, he goes on and says in verse 14, And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah, a barley meal, he shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. Mm. This is true as it relates to the jealousy that God experienced when we go after strange women in religion. It says this in Exodus. It says, For thus shall the Shall, for thou shalt not worship no other God. <clears throat> for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and go a whoring after the gods and the sacrifice. We read this before, and, and no one called thee, thou eat of his sacrifices. And thou take of thy daughters and to thy sons, and thy daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make the gods go a whoring after their gods. But then in that verse, I want you to, I don't want to miss this in verse 34. Okay? We're going to finish with this. Solomon speaks of what's called the day of vengeance. You want to write this down. As a man is provoked to jealousy over an adulterous wife and seek vengeance for being violated, God, who is a jealous God for his people, 
There is a day of vengeance. This day of vengeance is also called the day of the Lord. It deals with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Jeremiah 46, he says, come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and let the, men, the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield, and the Libyans that handle and, and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall deliver, and it shall be statutes, and made drunk of their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath the sacrifice in the north country, a country by the river Euphrates. Israel played the whore, committed adultery with other gods. God, who is a jealous God, will seek his vengeance on the day of the Lord. He said it's a day of vengeance, also known in Zechariah 12, is this, uh, uh, in, in 12 and 14. My last verse is go here found in Joel. It says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand. And look what he says this day is. He said it's going to be a day of darkness, gloominess, a day of clouds, and a thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There had not been ever the light neither shall there be any more after even to the years of many generations. Israel plays the whore against God. He's going to get vengeance because he's a jealous guy. Adultery in families creates jealousy because it's a bad thing. As a church, it's important for us as a people to be committed committed to the things of God, committed to the people of God. You know, I challenge our men all the time to be men of, be, be upstanding men, to be men who love their wives, who, who are committed to their wives, and who are committed to the sanctity of marriage, and who are committed to relationships that are strong. Children need to see it. This church needs to experience it. And the world needs to see it demonstrated before them because we live in a world where greater than 50% of our marriages end in divorce. And that's not just true in the world, that's true in the church. We divorce somebody in a heartbeat. We need to be committed in our relationship so that we can have the right relationship with God. Because God is a jealous God. He don't want you with nobody else. He wants you all to himself. Amen? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you.